Afternoon, everyone. Testing. There we go. Okay. Welcome to ComSat, the changing environment. I believe we changed the title. Um, so it is my job to introduce Deborah Peel and Bob Wasserman. Uh, I welcome you to read their bios in the in the booklet that we have. I just want to briefly say that. The reason why I am here at DCJS is because Deb Peel sent me an email one day and said, hey, this job would be great for you, training coordinator for the Crime Analysis Center program. So, oh, yeah, I'm, that looks like it would be fun, but do I really want to live in Albany. I'm kind of kind of okay in Pittsburgh. But you know what? It doesn't hurt to uh, you know put my resume in, see if I get a fo phone call. The next day, I get a phone call from DCJS, and I think to myself, Deb, what did you get me into? And um, now I'm here today, so I, I want to make sure I told that story, and uh, everybody can either thank her or blame her, depending on how you feel about me. So, Bob, Deb, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, obviously, I'm Bob Wasserman, and she's Deb. <laughs> uh, there are two parts to the presentation, or, or this presentation this morning. The first is mine, and then uh, Deb's going to do the real work. But I just want to talk about some issues that actually Im impact ComStat and which impact everything we do in the law enforcement arena right now. The first thing I have to do, however, is to get the little clicker here and hope that it clicks. It did. Good. Okay. It's the world of its policing. We are in a changing environment, and it's really going to change over the next five or ten years, and it has changed enormously from the past. And we're going to be oh, talking about, about its ComStat, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how it originated. And uh, I'm old enough that I was there with, uh, with its Maple and Bratton at the time that ComStat evolved at the NYPD. A number of years ago, that tells you how old I am. And uh, it's come a long way. But our world has come a long way as well. And we now face a series of its pressures, which are enormous. It's a, Jim Birch did a terrific job at lunch in laying out a number of those challenges we face. And we face them every day. And we have to think through what that means for everything we do as well. What Comstat was in the original days in New York, just quickly, was that Bratton became the police commissioner. Crime was out of control in New York. Uh, 2,100 homicides a year. A sense of disorder throughout the city. Tourism was way down. And they did not know how much crime there was every day. The thing that was stellar, I did a transition when he became the police commissioner. And the first thing he asked was, the first day on the job, how many crimes did we have in the city yesterday? And no one knew. Indeed, if they said it would take 90 days is to be able to give him that data. And Bratton, having worked in Boston with me years before, had become a person of the pin map in, when he worked in a district on a new project. Every day he put a red map with these little pins on the map. So he knew where things were. He knew all of that. And he said, I want to know every morning how much crime there is. And the guys in technology said, you can't have it. It's got to go through all these processes. So uh, Jack Maple said, have, them all, have every precinct call in every morning and say what they had the night before. And that's how it started. And then they started to move saying, we have to computerize this, which is... is it's computerized statistics. That's actually the term that Jack was using back then. And so it evolved from a session where the data came in, and every morning they knew how much of what there was. Not terribly accurately, but a good sense. And then there was a sense in the police department that nobody took crime seriously that indeed crime is a social problem, not something the police can do anything about. 
And Bratton, at the beginning of his time in New York, he was quite outspoken, said, we will reduce crime in New York City by 10% the first year. And he did. And another 10% the year after. And a larger percent the year after that until Giuliani fired him. Um, it's because he was on the front of Time magazine. But uh, so in those days, Comstat was an officious kind of authoritarian means of holding commanders accountable. They had to be in at 7 o'clock in the morning for the session. 7 o'clock when they live all over the city and outside of the city. Had to be in that room. And if you weren't in your seat, you'd be in real trouble. And then oh, Jack Maple uh, attacked them about what they knew and didn't know. And that's how it started. And the evolution that's gone on since then has dramatically changed. And as you'll see from a few of my comments and Debs, who has recently been at the NYPD, has spent a lot of time on the Comstat process. And it really has evolved around the world. So its community, its policing then was not something that was very widely accepted. As we'll see, it basically meant you had a couple of officers who went around establishing relationships. Didn't change really anything else going on in the business. And problem solving arose. And all these things are going to run through very quickly. The changing environment, it's police oversight. Oh, today, more attention is played on what police do than any time in our recent history. We are in the public limelight every day, not just from social media, but with news media and just with general members of the public who watch everything the police are doing and everybody has a comment to make about it. It's very hard for some officers oh, today who have been around quite a while to understand why we all have that attention on us. But it's the reality of today, and it's going to continue. It isn't going to go away, regardless of what we do. So we are living in a different environment. There are real concerns among the public about personal information, its protection. But it works both ways. Everybody wants to know everything. But at the same time, if you violate the standards of information, its protection about persons, There'll be a who and cry about it. So we face that kind of balance. There's a demand for greater oh, transparency. And transparency means lots of things. But uh, one of the things I've learned in the time I've been in this business is that you can't keep secrets. They will come out. And it's better to get out in front of a situation than to hold off and hope it'll go away. The worst example of that is the Laquan McDonald shooting in Chicago, where they had a video that showed the shooting occurring, and they kept it private for one year. And it made, uh, when it was its released, it made it much, much worse than would have ever happened if they had a said, we had a bad situation here, but here's the video that shows what went on. Now, there are lots of justifications for why that was delayed. In my own mind, they were absolutely wrong. But we have learned from that. And many executives around the country are getting information out as rapidly as they can and are committed to having transparency in what we do. Procedural justice. We've talked a lot about that in our field. Procedural justice with the community is really important. We don't talk enough about its procedural justice within our organizations. For all of the frustration that the public feels about procedural justice, our officers internally in many agencies feel exactly the same things. And they feel that there is not procedural justice in how things are handled with them inside the organization. The aversion to numbers, when Maple started out having Comstat, he would sit at the table and ask a commander, 
How are you dealing with this crime? How many stops have you made? How many searches did you do? It was all about the numbers. If you didn't have lots of numbers, you weren't being successful. So we don't use numbers anymore in CompStat. In the good ones, we talk about its problems. And how are you addressing this problem? Not saying the numbers are what counts. So that's a change in our environment. There are evolving structural changes in how police are being organized. And I'm going to spend a little bit of minute, a few minutes on that in a little bit, because that is a critical in understanding what its community policing has become and should have been all along. And its community engagement. We all talk about, and we've heard it in some of the sessions here over the last day, that its community engagement is critical. But what its community engagement means to most people in the police departments is going out to the community and saying, here's what we're doing, here's the state of crime, are there any questions? That's not community engagement. It's community engagement is when you bring in representatives of the community, a broad, so they really, not just groups that like the police, but others as well, and sit around a table and talk about the challenges of what's going on and how jointly we need to go forward in dealing with them. If you have that kind of engagement where everybody's equal at the table, the community will share responsibility for what the outcomes are. And absent that, they will not share responsibility and they will it's critique us if things go wrong. So we have real challenges in our environment. It's to get things right. I mentioned the cops on the dots. Bratton's first thing he did in New York, which actually worked pretty well, is because they had the maps the first day with the pins, he said, I want the cops to be standing where the pins are. And every day, the district commanders were told, you put your cops out where you're showing the things are happening. Because having a presence there is going to make a difference. That was Maple's idea. And it did. And it really started to drive down crime. But we've come a long way from that. F focusing on crime, accepting, as Bratton had said, we can make a difference. The police can make a difference on crime. It's not just a social problem. It's a problem that the police can help in resolve. And increasing, and it's collecting over the whole data. As I said at the beginning of New York, there wasn't any data it's collected. Now it's real time in many cases. Uh, you'll hear from Deb the kind of data that the NY, PD, many other departments, it's produced on a daily basis now. So people know this is the state of what's happening and where things are. Maple liked to create pain. If you sat through those original CompStat things, uh, its meetings, people would cringe when they heard how he was addressing commanders. Uh, his Maple was a lieutenant at the transit, its police, when, Bradham, when he came over to NYPD. And the lieutenant became in charge of CompStat, though he was, uh, became a deputy commissioner. And uh, he was vicious because he wanted to keep people on their toes that they had to produce, that you had to take this seriously. And the idea was to create accountability. Numbers without analysis actually didn't make sense. That's why they got into eventually this real crisis in New York of stop, question, and frisk, where all that counted was how many you did not what you were trying to achieve or the impact of it. So that's a lesson we've learned. And capturing the imagination is important. Doing things in a way that it captures the imagination of the department and the imagination of the community. Being creative. Doing things that people say that makes sense to us. In the early days, the CompStat process Cops on the Dots was an alternative to community policing. The term had evolved, but it was, it was viewed actually originally by Bratton 
as soft it's policing. You know, we walk around in neighborhoods and make friends and all this. It doesn't do anything about the crime, was the sense back then. We've come much further than that now. And we know that it's community, it's policing, is the best way to deal with crime. What lots of places are doing is abandoning the term, it's community policing. And with the new structures, are going back to using the term neighborhood, it's policing. And uh, I'll spend a few minutes on the importance of those structural changes. We've, over the years that I've watched what goes on in the country in policing, it seems like every year or two we have a new term, a new concept, a new idea. And they all have meaning. It's an approach to dealing with the problem of crime, of dealing with its community issues, et cetera. Intelligence led its policing, its community policing, hotspot policing, precision policing, evidence based policing, neighborhood policing, a flavor of the month in a sense. But there's a commonality between a lot of them. But they're not all the same. They are an approach that people think are going to make a difference. And it's important for us as managers, executives, leaders in policing, to understand all of those approaches and to adapt them to what we see as our need being. I happen to believe very strongly, I mean, I, I think the, each one you can look at, the intelligence-led policing. Uh, Jerry Ratcliffe at, at uh, Temple has been one of the primary advocates of that. And I've always argued with uh, Jerry, it's fine and it makes sense, but the community is left out of it. We can't leave the community out of approaches. They've got to be brought in and be a part of it. And you can go through each of these. You know, community policing is not just having officers who are out there engaging with the community while the rest of the police officers are responding to calls and the TAC unit is running in and out of the area and creating havoc with those with whom you've established a relationship. All these, so these all have pluses and minuses. It's community, it's policing, as I said, were special officers who would build relationships with the community. We now know that that is not the way to go. The experience over the last probably five or six years has taught us a lot. The most important thing in community policing, and in my mind, in policing it's today, is geography. That's what it's about. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting. When I was, a, uh, I was a lot younger, I was a member of the executive session at the Kennedy School at Harvard where the concept of community, it's policing, was largely defined. It was a, a group that met every three months over the course of, of a few years, involved large city chiefs, uh, Lee Brown from Houston, uh, it's a Darrell Gates from LA, Ed Meese, the Attorney General of the United States, a whole group of others, Herman Goldstein, David Bailey. It was a wonderful kind of discussion at the time. And at that time, some of us said it is about geography. And I say geography because what really works, we now are seeing across the country, is officers being assigned to a geographic area for which they are accountable for the state of the relationship between the police and the community and how crime and disorder are being addressed. Ownership of geography. Now, not a beat. One of the things we learned, and which has been now implemented throughout precincts in New York, is that the idea of beat accountability does not work because officers are never in a beat. Because, of nine, because we chase 911 calls, you're always going someplace else. And you want people to stay in a geographic area and have time to be able to deal with problems and engage with the community. In New York, in all the precincts now, they've abolished beats. 
There are no beats. And Chicago is in the process. We're implementing this there where they will abolish beats. And this is, there are a number of agencies around the country that are realizing the idea of beats is wrong. People say, how can that be? Because they need to be in a sector. And you take, let's say, in, in the precincts in New York, they had 12 or 14 beats. And so they simply divided those into three sectors. Officers have to stay in the sector and they get to know that they never go outside, ever. They have a rapid response unit that responds when this extra office is needed, but they own the geography. They own the relationships, and they have time free to be able to make a difference in engaging with the community about their problems. So its community, its policing has largely changed and is changing as we speak here today. Problem solving is, of course, a community policing component. Well, it's very interesting here that uh, in Boston, when I was heading operations in, in the 70s, Northeastern did a review of our calls for service and found that 50% of the calls for service from 911 were to addresses we went 12 times or more a year. Now, those aren't incidents, those are problems. And today now, as we start to look at the call loads and locations across the country and police agencies, the same thing is true. We're not responding to incidents in many of them. We're responding to problems with a past and a probable future. And community, it's policing says, when you respond to something, you don't just handle the incident. You gotta find out about the past and ask yourself, what can we do that will prevent the probable future? And that's kind of the new way that we're looking at, uh, the new way that we're looking at how you respond to calls for service. This all, as you'll see from Deb, has an enormous impact on how CompStat now is starting to run. But officers are accountable for geography and the, they are held accountable for what's going on and they start to work at solving problems of repeat calls. In Chicago, we just implemented this in one of the districts and in the first month and a half, the repeat calls for service are down 80% just because officers are starting to focus with community about how do we prevent things from constantly happening. So there's a lot of potential in that. And the key role in all this is the use of crime analysts. That without good analytical help, it all doesn't work. It's one of the things that departments are trying to do, and there's a standard evolving, that officers need to be uncommitted to calls for service to 35, 40% of their shift. But if that's the case, it's what do they do when they're uncommitted to calls? They should be problem solving. And they need its guidance on what can be done. And crime analysts can identify its patterns, but also strategies that can be used to address areas in which the problems exist. That is geography. You know the geographic area. You know where the, uh, where the, uh, where the problems are. You bring the community into discussions about it's what are we going to do about this. And this goes back to Herman Goldstein's original thesis on problem-oriented is policing. He used to talk about it's the bar, that every Friday and Saturday night, the police had to have officers respond to that because there were fights outside the bar. And he said, well, what you need to do, and this is problem solving, is meet with the owner of the bar in the community and say, how do we address it? and they would come up with a solution and it would go away. Bringing the community into the discussion so they share responsibility for the outcomes. It's a really critical thing that has evolved. But the patrol officer use of uncommitted time is really, it's critical, and crime analysts need to be able to help officers 
in developing what is the best use of that time. And George Kelling, who passed away a few months ago, came up with the term, when officers are out in the community and walking around, they need to have a felt presence. It's one of the most important things in my mind that we get our officers to understand. When an officer walks through a neighborhood, they have to touch everybody they pass with a nod, if it's with a look, with a comment, a hello, how are you? Instead of just walking, they're starting to engage with people as they pass. And what a difference that makes in terms of how community views the police. Investigations, which intelligence led its policing, began to address. There was some time ago a sense, it never went as far as it ought to have. I wrote a brief paper about this some years ago. In investigations, I always thought that a, a detective unit should have two major roles. One is those who go and investigate crimes, and the second is those who analyze crimes as an investigative its function. The thought process back then in Rochester, New York, was sort of at the lead on experimenting with, with some of this, was that if there were no solvability factors, then the case went to analysts who tried to figure out what linkages could we make with other crimes that would help us to be able to solve the crime. And if you have, you, you really have to divide analysts into geographic analysts and crime type analysts. My own sense is that every department should have some people, some an analyst who looks at robbery across the city and is up to date on what are the patterns that are changing? How are things changing? Where are they going? And then you need the geographic analysts who look at the geography and look at what's happening in this geography and how can officers best address it. They're two kind of separate dysfunctions that I think are very important. We have a lot of new technology. It's predictive, it's policing, it's a tasers, a facial recognition, license plate readers, shot spotter, lucid sentiment tracking, body cameras, and a patternizer, the uh, software that the NYPD has produced, which Deb can briefly talk about. But uh, all of these oh, technologies can have great use but the first things I mentioned when I came up there, they, can, they will be challenged if there's not transparency about how they operate and what the algorithms are if they use algorithms. There should be no secrets about this. And before they're initiated, the community should be brought into discussions about it so that they are aware of it. And we don't bring them in. So if, if you look at the situation in LA, when they went with, uh, with its predictive policing, Predpol, and the community was never a part of that, and they started finally raising questions, and they've gone through real challenges with predictive policing, it's because of that. The lack of transparency can kill us on any new technology. The same is true with ShotSpotter, is that uh, ShotSpotter has begun to outreach quite extensively about how it operates and is being more honest about the accuracy of it and lets people know this is how it operates. This is true with all of this in Detroit. If you've been following the facial recognition challenge that uh, James Craig has faced, where uh, you know, you can't, this stuff is, uh, is, a challenge, is a challenge in our environment. Uh, he had a, a US representative it's come in the other day and say, on facial recognition, they, he got the city council to agree they could use facial recognition software. And this, uh, this congresswoman said, then only African Americans can look at results of facial recognition of African Americans. White officers can't do that because they think that all black people look alike. Well, that presented, that presented, that's the kind of reaction that we, that we will and are continuing to get 
as we roll out these software, this new, these new technological approaches. And you have to be prepared to address that. And you best can address it if you bring the community into discussions as you're starting to look at these kinds of new technology. So it's crime analysts, in my mind, are the, are the, uh, are the glue that binds all this sits together. And they're incredibly important in the organization and they need to be empowered by management of the organization to really get engaged with officers in helping them to develop strategies and patterns in the piece of geography in which they are working. They are incredibly important. And my own sense is that if you are a medium-sized agency even, you want to have a crime analyst for each major geographical area you have so that they really can work with the officers out there in developing strategies for how they use their uncommitted time. It can make an enormous amount of time. I mean, I, it can have an enormous impact. And then, when they get it's called into appearing at a CompStat session, a performance management session, they will be able to respond in a credible and meaningful manner when the boss says, how are you dealing with these problems? They will have a strategy and will have a sense of what the impact is. So as we think about that, so we have to think in all we do about protection of personal rights, protection of information, I mean, all of these things, and we need to audit how the tools are done. I think ShotSpotter, by the way, is a great, is a great tool, but the impact of it and how it's operating needs to be audited. Almost all of the technologies that we do ought to be audited uh, by us, by the agency, so you, you find out exactly what is the, uh, what actually is the result of its use. So, analysis with urgency, did I spell it right? Yes. Is uh, yours. So you'll take it forward. Hello? No. Here, you have the button at the top. No. Right there. Okay, all set. Yes? No? Maybe? Uh, no, you, you, again. You can't keep pushing the button. No. Okay, yeah, it's fine. Just speak. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So what does all that mean for crime analysts? Um, I got here late yesterday, uh, so I've only been to today's sessions, but the two I got to and lunch were fabulous. The one I just did next door, I think you guys are in there, and Niagara Center, just an incredible story of really well done analysis. Um, a homicide case, they used every tool they had at their disposal, they put a lot of uh, time and effort and um, interpretation of data and skill and knowledge into what they achieved to identify their suspects and it was fabulous. Um, earlier this morning I actually went to a session on uh, research which even as an analyst I tend to, I will admit, be sometimes bored. It was fabulous. Angela Hawkins did a, a great presentation on really how truly easy it is to do some basic research. Even um, randomized control experiments, you can do them in a simple way that is useful to operations. So in the midst today of this um, blending of analysis and intelligence and real time and all those sorts of things, what I feel might be getting lost a little bit is just traditional crime analysis what's up and what's down, and how quickly do the people you work for know what's up and what's down and what's changing and what is happening more than it should be and what needs to be done about it. And that, that really concerns me. So when I talk about analysis with a sense of urgency, I don't necessarily mean it on an individual analyst basis. I think most of you as analysts go to work with some 
sense of urgency. I, I hope you do, because it is urgent work that we do. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I have been an analyst for a pretty long time now, from the very smallest agencies in central Massachusetts up to the largest at NYPD. I was most recently the senior analyst there and was responsible for hiring their first 100 civilian analysts that were put out to the precincts. In order to do that, we had to interview about 1,000 to find 100. Um, but since then, they've, they've made a real difference. I think most of them go to work with a sense of urgency. Um, but I mean kind of urgency about the profession. You know, when I first started this job, the smallest agency, I thought I was the coolest person on earth because I could just go in the back door and my credentials got me in the back door of the station. Um, my credentials were imaginary. I mean, it was just they said, hey, you don't have to come in the front every day and let somebody buzz you in, you can go in the back. I thought I had arrived. There were 15 cops at that department. Then I went on to a, a city department, Newton, Massachusetts. Um, it's really where Boston College is located. Uh, a very affluent city, about 175 cops at the time. There, I had to punch in a code in the back door and put my finger in. So then I thought, <laughs> wow, am I special. <laughs> then I went to the state police, and there we had a little combination of put in a code, put in your finger, hold up your card, and then the door would buzz open. So I thought, now I've really arrived to the highly secret squirrel classified stuff. Now at NYPD, you have to go through a gate, you gotta scan your card, you gotta do that. And still, I thought that was so cool. Every day, every day for five years. Um, so I've had a sense of urgency. What bothers me is the profession is not treated with a sense of urgency. Large institutions like IACP, PERF, the Police Foundation, all of these go out and do evaluations of agencies. And very, very rarely do I ever see the first thing mentioned is, do you have an analyst there? I don't know who they think is going to do all this analysis and work with all of that data if they don't have an analyst. And so I think it's time that we step up and get out there and stand up and be heard. And the way that I think that happens is with attention to some of these things. I am a true believer in, Com in Comstat, whether it's you know, the sheriff and Barney Fife or 37,000 cops. There is serious stuff to talk about at least one hour a week. Are you kidding me? If you have five cops up there, they've got a lot of power, they're driving fast cars, they are sworn to use lethal force. You don't have stuff to talk about for at least an hour a week? I mean, come on. If analysts are producing analysis every week, the only way that it's utilized is if someone's held accountable to it. So I understand as an analyst, and perhaps uh, certainly as an analyst, maybe in a regional crime analysis center, it's not up to you to dictate to an agency that they're going to hold some sort of Comstat. But your work can take on elements of Comstat. And I'll talk about that a little bit. You can do your own Comstat. Um, thresholds, you know, just a look at are we inside or outside, what would be the normal range, I think is critical not just for index crimes, but from everything from those seven index crimes down to all of your calls for service, be it noise, dog complaints, kids gathering, crashes, whatever it may be, if they're outside the normal range at an average agency, not only do the citizens probably want it addressed, but that is the stuff that is draining your resources. And if your analysts are always too busy staring at a camera or looking for that big dramatic case, then who's looking at whether noise complaints are going up? Because sometimes noise complaints are evidence of people gathering with nefarious intent. And what about the shopliftings at Walmart? Everybody brings them up and then kind of pushes them aside like, ah, not much we can do about that. Everywhere across this country, Walmart's the big hotspot on the map. Well, if it's your hotspot, it's your hotspot. You know, people are stealing some of that stuff to go fence it, to do other more serious stuff. It can't be ignored. Thresholds lead to patterns. NYPD is pattern obsessed, and I think in a good way. Um, 
precision policing. I'll talk about my definition of it. I think it's in line with Commissioner Braden's definition of it. But if it's not, just go with mine for the day anyway. Um, and knowledge and the role of all of this. So this is ComStat. I only show this picture because I went on Google, you know, go to images and put in ComStat. And this came up, and this is me. I was in the room where it happened, like Hamilton says. Um, like Bob just mentioned, ComSat has changed dramatically. I travel around the country now, and I have to hear every story over and over again about, oh, we tried an NYPD model, but we don't do that adversarial. It's like the wire. People scream at each other. No, none, none of that happens. There's no screaming. There's no swearing. It's nothing like the wire. It's intense, but it's very professional. And the numbers only serve as the most basic introduction to the discussion. The rest of the discussion is about things no one would have thought about before. It's about what is really happening out there and what is being done about it. It's no longer how many arrests did you make. It's are you focused on arresting those who are contributing to the violence? What were they arrested for? What was the average age of the people you were arresting? Why were they arrested? Where were they arrested? And what relation do they have to whatever is going on in that precinct or that borough? Um, oh, forgot almost the key part about the urgency thing. Um, so at the, the end of the room in the Jack Maple Comstat Center is a big sign on the wall that says, we will be relentless until New York City is, in fact, the safest large city in America. It is now, in fact, the safest large city in America. But how many of you have relentless written, written anywhere in the agency where you work, or the center where you work, or anything that you come in contact with every day when you start work? Is relentless anywhere? Do you think about being relentless? Shouldn't we be relentless? I think NYPD does, a, I know they do, a really good job of stressing being relentless every day and being relentless about that. And I think as analysts, we need to try to be more relentless about what we're doing and about how we present our profession. I have this like vision in my head of when things are going bad, whether it be in a precinct or be in a community or be in a region, of a bunch of analysts like walking together into their offices, maybe even on a Saturday or at night, and being like, oh my god, we have got to get on this. This is, this is getting bad here, so let's all get in here and get to work at it. I think it does happen some places, but I don't know that it happens overall everywhere. So I know most of you are familiar with the four tenets of ComStat. Timely and accurate intelligence. God, I can't even remember myself. Rapid response. Rapid res response doesn't mean getting to the scene fast. It means rapid response to the timely and accurate intelligence. Effective tactics means just that, not just any tactic, but effective tactics based upon what the timely and accurate intelligence and the rapid response to it is telling you to do. And then ComSet is nothing if not relentless follow-up because guess what? We're going to do all this analysis again and look at all of this again and determine what's up and what's changing and what's evolving, what do we need to do about it? Every single, I think it should be every week, could be every other for some people, could be once a month, but regularly you need to think about crime. So whether your agency or whomever you work for actually holds a ComStat meeting or not, or what model it follows, your analysis can follow all of this. It can certainly be accurate and timely. It can certainly recommend um, and be disseminated in a way that is rapid. There can be recommendations for what effective tactics need to be done, and you can produce it again and again until people start paying attention to it. Um, just briefly in that process, I want to talk about the crime triangle. I think most of you are probably familiar with what you need to have crime. A motivated offender, a suitable victim, an absence of a capable guardian. If any one of those three things are missing, you can't have crime. You don't have a motivated offender, you're not going to have any crime. The motivated offender comes along and there's no victim, you're not going to have crime. And if there's a capable guardian there while the two are staring at each other, you're probably not going to have crime then either. Um, your analysis should respond to all of this. Who are your motivated offenders? Are they old? Are they young? What are they doing? Are they drug addicted? Are they um, emotionally disturbed? 
are they from out of town? Are they from in town? Are they in a gang? What is it out of school? Who are they? And who are your victims in the very same way? Are they old, young, in town, out of town? Where are they coming from? Why are they being victimized? Why are they suitable targets? And then who should be the capable guardian? It can't always be the police. But if you're not thinking about all those factors in your analysis, then you're really not getting at the root causes of whatever the crime is that you're looking at. And once you've done all of that analysis, as an analyst, I mean this, you should start thinking about what are you trying to accomplish? Do you really have the intel there for an apprehension? Or is apprehension just, you know, it's the cool thing? Most often, we don't even have a named offender. So apprehension shouldn't be the first thing on the list of what that rapid response will be. Um, other times, maybe it's about hardening the target. I think in order to effectively harden the target, you need to know who your victims are and why they're being victimized. And then harden whatever that is that is impacting them. It's not all about bad lighting and overgrown bushes. There's lots of other things that can be hardened and addressed in relation to making fewer victims. And then finally, generally, um, we're trying to suppress crime. And sometimes I feel like that's like kind of like, like uh, the default position or something, that it's viewed that way. But I think suppression means fewer victims. The goal should always be fewer victims, fewer victims, fewer victims. That's what we're trying to achieve. Not more arrests, more arrests, more arrests, fewer victims. And if you can suppress crime, then that means victims aren't happening in that time that it's being suppressed. But generally, it's the squad or detectives that are doing apprehension. It's your community policing people that are doing target hardening. And it's your patrol that is doing suppressing. Patrol can only suppress adequately and effectively if they have the analysis to tell them what do you need to be looking for now? Where is it going to happen? What time is it going to happen? And how is it going to happen? And this is where I suggest you be to suppress all of it. And maybe talk to a few people, maybe gather some intel in the process of suppressing, but they need that actionable analysis to make that happen. This might be a little hard to read, but it's a, just an Excel spreadsheet of thresholds. This was actually done in Python only because of the volume of the data. The calculations are easily done in Excel. A condition is one standard deviation beyond the norm, which in translation simply means a little bit above normal. So you should start as an analyst identifying what is a little bit above normal and why is it headed in that direction. If you're looking at things in a seven day and 28 day time periods, 28 days if something is getting a little bit above normal, then you want to get on that before it gets worse. Because worse is a spike, two standard deviations beyond the norm. If things are at a spike, it's a spike, it's red, it's serious. It's already become a serious problem. And now somebody's really got to address it because now it's really serious. You can do this on everything. Here's another version in Excel. It's probably a little harder to read. But even though something might be up compared to last year, doesn't necessarily mean that it's outside the norm if you're looking at three to five years of historical data. What you want to prioritize is what is outside that norm. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can ignore everything else. Victims aren't comforted by the fact that they're still within the normal range of activity. And you can't say, well, we don't have time for your housebreak today because you know it's in the normal range. No, I just mean when you have to prioritize resources, where you have to think about where are you going to send your cops and what are you going to ask them to do, you might want to prioritize what is heading most quickly in the worst direction. Here are these are crashes. So as part of um, neighborhood policing and sector integrity, precincts were divided into three or four sectors. Here, looking at total crashes, 34 Charlie is the one that's outside the norm. So instead of just drifting all around the 3-4 precinct, when they're trying to do their traffic enforcement, they should go to Charlie sector. This is all this is telling you. You can do it by time of day or shift. Same thing. What time do we really need to start to make an impact on things? What thresholds help you to do is identify where there are patterns. If you are breaking your index crimes down into enough subclassifications and you see something like I don't know, um, 
food delivery robberies, not just broadly the robberies are up, but something specific like food delivery suddenly up in your 28 days, that could be a sign of a pattern developing. I think instead of waiting for patterns to come to us, we should look at every incident like it's part of a pattern because most likely the report we get is not the first time that perp has done that. It's just the first time we've acknowledged consciously that particular incident. If it's got pattern written all over it by the MO and the way you went about it, the description, then look back in any recent activity like that and find the pattern. We joke about it at NYPD, like a one-hit pattern. You can't have a one-hit pattern, but a one-hit pattern is like that report you read where you just know this is a pattern. Don't wait for him to do it again to start the pattern. Find the pattern. Crime theory tells us everything is a pattern. The perp will keep doing what they're doing for as long as they're successful at doing it. So chances are that report you're reading is not the first time he's done it. Um, this is a picture of Rebecca Schutt, one of the analysts in the Bronx. Um, she's very good. She's talking about Patternizer. Patternizer, maybe you've heard about it. It's a really cool tool. But it does not make patterns. It helps with the efficiency of making patterns. Instead of printing out forest's worth of hard copy reports to read the narrative, highlights and things to look for the pattern factors in it, it just helps you to do that online much faster. Use a lot of filters to narrow down what you're looking for. It'll put it on a map, but you still need the human element. It's an algorithm, but it will not work all on its own. And most of the other technologies that Bob talked about will not work without some human element to it. Um, luckily, NYPD uses the um, official definition of patterns. The only thing that is a pattern is a report, or two or more, that suggests that the same perp or group of perps committed the offense. Nothing else is a pattern. If you have a whole bunch of the same thing, that's a cluster, not necessarily a pattern. So start looking for those patterns. Um, Precision policing to me is very, 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 very focused policing. It's also practical policing. There's been a lot of coverage in the past few days about the fact that um, arrests, misdemeanor arrests specifically, are down around the country. And experts are wondering why. I'm not wondering why. This is by design at NYPD. It's not by chance. All enforcement is down because what they are enforcing is what's contributing to the violence. And I know it's not by chance for a couple of reasons, but this was Chief Shea um, in March 2018 saying we are going to keep crime down with the lightest touch possible. That's what he was saying over a year ago, that we are going to keep crime down with as little enforcement as possible because they are focused on who is contributing to the violence. And that doesn't just mean changes in social society. It also means changes in how resources are being deployed. And back to those Peelian principles, we are not looking for the presence of police coverage. We're looking for the absence of crime. That's the goal. So that is what they have been working towards. And I think other large agencies are doing the same. And that is why misdemeanor arrests are down. It's as simple as that. So what I think we need from analysts is very focused analysis and very focused actions. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be pretty. Don't worry about the graphics. If the people you are supporting, the cops you are working for, are being held accountable to carrying out analysis-driven tactics and strategies, then they will have to use the analysis, whether it's pretty or not. And do your analysis in the way that you are going to expect them to make use of it, even though you may not may not have them being held accountable. Be the crime scholar in your agency. Most often, you are the most educated person there on any given day, depending on the size of your agency. I was certainly not that at NYPD. But I mean, you're very smart. So be smart in your jobs and display that smartness. Be present. If there are discussions going on about new technologies or new things that you're going to get, a new desktop computer, a new laptop, Involve yourself in that and inject yourself in that because you're the one that's going to be using it. And you're probably the one that knows how that stuff works best. So step up and be present. Know your data. Know how to do things. 
when we finally hired those 100 analysts, the first thing I said to them on day one was, you all described yourselves as being proficient in Excel. I've learned that pretty much none of you are. Because you know what they do in college is they provide them with, with pre-filled spreadsheets. The data is already there. And they say, click this button, click this button, and it gives you a percent change. Do this, and it gives you that. Very often, they don't know how to work with just raw data, raw, messy, messy data. So watch YouTube videos, get Excel and Access and GIS for Dummies books, and know how to use your data efficiently. You don't all have to be coders. I think that that's valuable, but yeah. Just know how to do these things. Know your data. Know where it comes from. Understand it. Go into dispatch if you're not sure about calls for service. Get things fixed at the source if you can. Do all of that. And analyze. Analyze, 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 analyze. It's your data. Analyze it. Do whatever you want with it. Um, Angela this morning said, be prepared to fail cheerfully. If it doesn't come out the way you want the first time, cheerfully try it again and try it again. And if your chief doesn't like it the first time, but you feel strongly about it, reformat it, present it again, call it something different, and they might like it that day. But keep at it. You're the analyst. You know what you're doing. Um, work some weekends. Make yourself so valuable and so necessary to step up. I'm going way past my time already. She's flashing the sign at me. Um, be urgent about what you do. Do traditional crime analysis. It is valuable, whether they know it or not, to know what's changing out there on the street on a very, very regular basis. And if you have any questions, we'll be here to answer them. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Everybody has to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah.